oaths are needed. James chapter 5 and verse 12. James chapter 5 and verse 12. Praise God. James 5 and 12, the Bible says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into condemnation. Now, condemnation is the result of sin. And condemnation, in my opinion, is the work of the enemy. Amen? Amen? Conviction is the work of the Holy Ghost. Condemnation is the work of the enemy. And so James said, if we don't be careful about what we say with our mouth, the devil will get a, get a, get a piggyback ride in our life just because of what we said with our mouth. So he said, let your yes be yes and your no be no, because if you won't, you're giving place to the devil. Does that make sense? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33 this morning. Matthew 5 and verse 33. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said of them of old time. Now this is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus continuing. And notice in the Sermon on the Mount, he always says, you've heard of the old time, but I say unto you. You've heard of the old time, but I say unto you. And here, he's doing it again, Matthew 5, 33. Again, I say Ye have heard, it hath been said of them of old, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Jesus said, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, that is God himself, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yes, yes, and no, no, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil, or is used by the devil to bring condemnation in your life, because it is sin. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 21, if you'll pull that up for me, Sister Hurst, Deuteronomy 23 and verse 21. Have you ever promised to do something and did not do it? Let me be the first one to raise my hand. Anybody else here ever done that? You promised to do something and you didn't do it. Now, the truth of the matter is we've all done that. If there's something in the communications of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount we ought to get is that we ought to put our rocks down. Because when it comes to adultery, he pretty much said, you've all done it. When it comes to murder, he pretty much said, you've all done it. And when it comes to forswearing yourself or lying, because that's what it is, if you promise to do something and you don't do it, that's a lie. We've all done it. What Jesus, what the only thing the Old Testament really does for us is it convinces us, or it should convince us, that we need a Savior. That we are all sinners. Now, that's the bad story. The good story is, we have a Savior. But we have to realize we need a Savior, so we'll run to Him and get His salvation. The Bible does speak of it as His salvation, not our salvation. We get into Him, and in Christ, we are covered. Outside of Christ, we're not covered. Amen? And the church is the body of Christ. That's why you're not going to be saved outside the church, because you've got to be in Him and be covered by Him. The Bible says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus covereth our sins. But for the blood of Jesus to cover our sins, yes, we have to repent, but then we have to walk together. Amen? But we've all promised to do something and did not do it. I've promised I'll be there in five minutes, and it took me 15. It doesn't matter who I blame it on. I can say, well, I had a telephone call. or, But if I promised to do it, I lied. That's why the Bible says don't make promises. Don't promise anything. 
That's what Jesus said. Because it may be inconsequential, and it may be insignificant, and it may not make a whole lot of difference. But if it's a lie, it's a sin. <clears throat> it's called lying, and that is a sin. Deuteronomy 23 and 21. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not be slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. So the Bible does say it is sin. That's why you get condemnation. Man, I can do something just like that, and I know it's sin because immediately the devil jumps on my back. Amen? And the longer you live for God, you ought to realize when it's just the devil jumping on your back. The way to get him off is to repent. Say, Lord, I was wrong. Forgive me. The good news about the New Testament is we all, we're all adulterers. We're all murderers. We're all liars. But when we repent, God will forgive us. It is better to say, can you go to 1 Corinthians 4 and 19? 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians 4 and 19, and then I'll be staying in the same book, 1 Corinthians 16 and 7. It is better for us to say, if the Lord will. Our short way of saying that is, Lord willing. Lord willing. Lord willing, we'll go here. Lord willing, we'll go there. Lord not willing, I hope we don't go here. We don't go there. 1 Corinthians 4 and 19, but... I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will, he said. Go to chapter 16 and verse 7 in the same book, if you will. Chapter 16 and verse 7. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. Can you go to one more, James chapter 4? James chapter 4 and verse 15 this morning. James 4 and 15. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. And so the best way to handle the old mouth, because it's unruly, is just to not make a promise, just say, if the Lord will. Lord willing, we're going to do this or that or the other. A oath, a vow, and a promise are the same thing. All have broken promises. And all have thus for, because of that, have sinned. Now, we like to put them in big categories and little categories, but the little sins will send you to the same hell the big sins will send you to. There won't be categories of hell where the big sinners get to go and the little sinners get to go. They all go to the same hell. So it doesn't matter if I lie about something big in my mind or I just lie about something small maybe i said Skyler, i'll be there in five minutes and it's just my kid after all my goodness can i do what i want not if i promised and i've had some people come to me and they say uh, pastor I, I told so and so i'm going to be at x what do you think i said it don't matter what i think <laughs> it's not in my hands anymore you have to do what you promised you would do if you want my opinion don't make any promises before you ask me. Because once you promise, that's your word. And your word is your reputation. Your word is your witness. And we've all failed. God will let us get up. But that doesn't mean we should just excuse ourselves over and over. But learn from those things and say, you know what? I've got to be more careful about what I let come out of my mouth and what I promise I'm going to do and what I promise I'm going to help and what I promise I'm going to pay. Maybe say, if possible, I'll, I'll be there. Or if possible, I'll hurt their feelings. It's better to hurt somebody's feelings than to lie. Now, that don't, don't mean me malicious. Don't mean me mean, but do be honest. Amen? Amen? But those things are all, they're all the same thing. And we've all broken them. We like to point at the big ones, but promising to be there in just five minutes and taking ten minutes is breaking a promise. That's why we should just say, if the Lord will. But we should only say, if the, or we could say this. It's best to say, I will try. Everybody say, I will try. But you know what? If you say, I will try, and then you don't try, you lied. 
That's why we got to be careful what we let come. Because sometimes, and I'm as guilty as anybody else in this house, I'll say things because I really don't want to try. I just want to get past it. I'm just going to say something to get them off my back. You got to be careful because then you got to go to an altar of repentance and say, Lord, I, I lied. I told them I would try and I didn't do a, a thing to try. It'd be a horrible thing to go to hell over something like that. Something that we consider insignificant, but God, God says that's sin. Don't do that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, because if not, you're committing sin. We should be concerned that we may be teaching deception methods to our children. In a weekly broadcast called Fact or Fiction, the co-host of the show has to guess if the statements revealed about the subject they're talking about is fact or fiction. They'll give several different scenarios and they'll say, now which ones are fact and which ones are fiction. Some sound incredulous, but often they are true. Other statements sound as if they should be true, but they're just fiction. And we live in a culture where it is becoming increasingly more difficult to differentiate fact from fiction. Have y'all been watching the political world? Who knows what's true and who knows what's not true? I don't know. I have no idea what's true and what's not true. We live in a world that's just, everybody says whatever they think everybody else wants to hear. Now, we're called as Christians to rise above that. Amen? Not to tell lies anymore, but to walk in truth, not just with God, but with one another. As Christians, let our words be true and let deception be put away from us. In the Sermon on the Mount, it was not intended to nullify or replace the commandments of God given to Moses, but to focus on them and use them as a leaping board, as a launching pad for the truth that God would speak to us in the New Testament. He had not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. So Jesus addressed the principles of truthfulness in all areas of our life. Jesus declared that one's word should always be trustworthy. Have you ever had somebody tell you something and they didn't do it? That's okay out in the world, and it happens in the church. But we're called to rise above that. Somebody say amen. amen. A trustworthy, now to be trustworthy means you're worthy of trust. That's why I often teach, don't trust somebody until they prove they're worthy of trust. Amen? amen. Man, if, if somebody says, I'm going to fix your plumbing at your house, and they say, but I need you to pay me ahead of time. And you pay them ahead of time? Don't get mad at them. You put trust in somebody you don't even know. Trustworthy is something that has been earned. Amen? Amen. That's why you got the BBB, the Better Business Bureau. You can go look and see now, have, have they been trustworthy with others? Because if they hadn't been trustworthy with others, they won't be with you either. So there, there's, there's nothing wrong with uh, letting people prove themselves. Even John, when it came to repentance, he said, you're going to have to give fruits of repentance. You're going to have to prove there's a change before I'll trust you. But we as Christians should live so that people will trust us, that we are trustworthy people that speak the truth. Honesty in conversation should always be an attribute of the Christian life. No oath is needed if a person just tells the truth. Can you imagine buying the house and not having to sign any paperwork? If the bank said, you ain't got to sign nothing, we know they're going to take care of it. They take care of it. That's why you've got a credit score. Hello? They do that stuff for a reason. Because the next time you go to get something, they're going to look back and say, hmm. Wonder what their record is. Now, here's the good news. You can improve your credit score, but you got to start being trustworthy. 
You can get out, you can get mad and upset all you want to. They won't give me, they won't let me buy a house, they won't let me buy a car, they won't let, there's a reason they won't let you do that. But if you get a good credit score, and I, I'm I'm not I'm not perfect by any means, but brother, they send me stuff in the mail every stinking day. They're calling and begging me to get another credit card. I, I don't want no more credit cards. Oh, but this one here. This one's going to pay you just to carry it around. I know that's a lie. But when you get trustworthy, listen, your reputation will always precede you. Now, here's the good news. Reputations can be changed with work. It's easier to keep a reputation than to restore one. But it is possible to restore one. Somebody say amen. amen. I've had a lot of people come to my office. Brother Marlon can attend to this. Come in and say, Pastor, I'm going to, I'm here and I'm going to be here forever. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll just look at him and say, we'll see. That's not being mean. It's just, a, you won't have to say that a year from now. Because your life will have told me that. I look at Brother Malcolm and I trust him completely because he has proven to me you can trust me. He needs not tell me that anymore. I'll give him a key to my car, a key to my house because he has proven to me through his life that, Pastor, I'm here. I'm faithful. When I do the bills, the church books and whatever, he's a giver. He gives to every. He's a young man, but he's fully engaged and he's fully involved. And he's trustworthy. Somebody say praise the Lord. It would be foolish to take people at their word only. Unless there's a record to prove that their word is right. Somebody say amen. amen. But once you establish a good repertoire, a good record, then people can start believing the things that we say. Beyond the law of Moses were long-standing oral traditions and teachings that developed over time to become synonymous with the commandments of Moses. Pharisees held these traditions of the elders is what they would call them as equal to the written commandments of the Torah as illustrated in the confrontation with Jesus over the disciples eating without washing their hands. That was not the law of Moses. That was just a tradition that had been written into one of what they called the Talmuds. They had the, the, the Jerusalem Talmud, they had the Babylonian Talmud. And their Talmuds, as big as the law of Moses was, which I would include somewhat the first five books, the Torah, as big as that was, the Talmuds were bigger. They made more and more rules, and you couldn't eat anything without washing your hands. That's a wonderful idea, but it's not the law of God. Jesus answered the accusations of the Pharisees with a question, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? Matthew 15, 3. Can you pull that up? Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? That's why we have to be very careful. I love our traditions. I'm going to keep our traditions. But I never want to be guilty of making traditions truth. And truth, traditions. Some things, if it's truth, God didn't forget to put it in His Word. If it's the truth, You'll be able to go to the book. There's where God dealt with it. And if God didn't deal with it, I don't mind us keeping it. But I'm not going to make it a doctrine. Somebody say praise the Lord. We, I, I've been in Pentecost all my life and I've seen this happen too many times. We'll kill you if you take away from the Word of God. But we'll embrace you if you add to but the book says you can't add to and you can't take away. So I'm very careful when someone says we got to do, everybody's got to do this. All right, I need some scripture. If you can give me some book, I'll preach it next service. But if there ain't no book, I'll keep the tradition. But I'm not going to make it truth. Somebody say praise the Lord. 
And so washing hands, though it was a good idea, was not the law of Moses. And Jesus returned and said, why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? In other words, don't let your traditions ever get in the way of truth. I ain't hanging out with sinners. Well, the most holy person ever did, did. Jesus exposed some of the traditions. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not about getting rid of traditions. The Bible in one place says, keep the traditions we've handed to you. There are good traditions, but it never teaches to make traditions truth. And many traditions, if we just let the Holy Ghost deal with things, he'll take care of it. Jesus exposed some of the traditions that had been added to the commandments. He condemned them in Mark 7, verse 7. If you can go there, Sister Hurst, Mark 7 and 7. He condemned those who were teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, I want you to get what he said. He said, you're teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Nothing wrong with washing your hands before you eat. He said, but don't make that a doctrine. We're laying aside the commandment of God. Ye hold the tradition of men. We've got to be careful that we don't let the traditions of men overcome the commandments of God. That's why as we live for God, we should become more holy and desire more holiness. But we should never become so holy that sinners can't walk in and get a hug. We should never become so holy that we look down our nose at how holy we are and how unholy they are. Now you have defiled the very reason Jesus came by your own holiness. Somebody say amen. Jesus was not negating the law. No, no, he was raising the bar. He was simply returning the attention of the people to the spirit behind the law. The first law that we looked at in our lesson plan was concerning the commandment against murder. And in the, Jew, in the Jewish pharisaical tradition, it was okay to hate somebody or talk bad about somebody as long as you didn't murder them. But Jesus said, you have heard it said you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. He didn't lower the bar. He raised it. Apparently, the Pharisees permitted one to express anger as long as they did not take a life. But Jesus countered this tradition by saying, Whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, fool, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. He said, Let's get beyond the act of murder and talk about the heart of murder. And when he said that, he caught every one of us in the same net. You're upset with a murderer. What you ought to be saying is, Lord, forgive every murderer because I'm going to need your mercy. Somebody say amen. Teach respect for one another and encourage but guards one's speech toward another. Be careful how you talk to other people is what he was saying because you're going to give an account for that. Don't ever tell your child you're stupid or you're ignorant or you're dumb. God don't approve of that. Don't ever tell anybody else that either. We shouldn't even talk about them behind their back that way because God hears and God knows. But we're to call to love one another and to help one another console one another, and even correct one another in a spirit of love. And somebody one time come in and said, Pastor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go handle this right now. I said, don't go handle it right now, not with the attitude you got. You said I'm supposed to handle. The Lord said go. Yeah, the Lord said go to them. But you better go to the prayer room first and pray through and say, and get to where you can talk to them because you love Jesus addressed another tradition when he said in Matthew 5 and 43, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now this was not part of the law of Moses. This was just a tradition they had developed. He said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. The Ten Commandments did not teach the Israelites to hate their enemies. 
The opposite was true. They were taught not to hate the Edomites, for he is thy brother, the, the word said. And, and they were instructed not to hate the Egyptians because they were once strangers in the land of Egypt. He said, love your enemies. Jesus went on in verse 44, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. See, if, if, you, can, if you can just love those who love you, he said, sinners do that. As Christians, we're called to up the bar. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Another Jewish tradition was, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. This was another Jewish tradition. It wasn't part of the law of Moses. But Jesus addressed it that day. To forswear means to swear falsely. We would call it perjury in our language. To say something you have no intention of doing. To perjure yourself before God. To say, I promise I will do X. And when you say it, you know you have zero intention. Of People come to the altar and repent before God, knowing full well when I leave here, I'm going to go right back into that same sin. Now the thing about God is you can't deceive God. There are people who don't receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost because they don't really repent. They say, forgive me, they say, I'm sorry, but in their mind they're thinking, if I can just fool the pastor, if I can just get the church to believe I'm real. But the thing is, you can't fool God. And that is an act of swearing falsely before the Lord to promise something before the Lord. I promise God, and we've I've done this, we probably all know. I promise God, I'm all yours. Now, when you said I promise, when you said I promise, God heard it. You you promise? I promise. Now, that's why the mercy of God is so awesome. Because He'll forgive us. And I believe when God forgives, He forgets. I don't believe God holds our past over our head. I believe He literally does forgive us and moves on. His mercies are new every morning. Thank God, because we need them every morning. But that doesn't mean you can just not repent of it. Next time you come to the altar before God, you've got to say, God, I lied, and I lied to you. And I'm sorry. Forgive me. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise but I've, I've done that. Probably many of us have. To intentionally swear a false oath or to falsify a promise to tell the truth. Through time, the Jews had so construed the law to allow an exception for an oath that had been made in which the name of God was not invoked. In other words, if you promised something and did not say in the name of the Lord, it didn't matter if you kept it or not. They had created a loophole where they could swear an oath and not feel bound to perform their promise and not be found guilty if they did not perform their promise. And Jesus dealt with it. He said, don't do that. If you're going to say, I'm going to do something, do it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, whether you say in the name of the Lord or not. Let your words be true. In an attempt to undo a deceptive practice of permissible perjury, Jesus commanded that the people refrain from oaths. He says, swear not at all. Don't make promises you have no intention of keeping. Because God sees. Rather than swearing an oath, we should speak the truth and let our communication, the Bible says, be yea, yea, and nay, nay. One of the Ten Commandments is a prohibition against bearing false witness. And in that manner, the Bible does deal with it. Because if you say something you have no intention of, taking, of keeping, you're bearing false witness. And God sees that as sin. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. The Bible says in Numbers 30 and verse 1. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, 
He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So God listens to everything. The Bible says in Matthew, every idle word we speak, we'll give an account for it. Now, I believe the only way you won't give an account for it is if you give it, get it covered in the blood of Jesus. I don't believe we're going to judgment if we're covered by the blood and God bring it all up. Because if it's covered by the blood, he took care of it. But if we don't get it covered, it says you'll give an account. I don't know how you're going to give an account except say there, stand there and say, God, you're right to throw me in hell. I'm a lousy, rotten sinner. You're not going to get before God and be able to play Mickey Mouse games. When he opens your conscience up, there won't be no, won't be no self-deception even going on. You'll know I'm worthy of death. God takes it quite seriously when one makes a promise and fails to follow through. Here's the question. Why is it easier to lie than to tell the truth? For one reason, we got this old nasty flesh on us. I have said things before, and the Spirit of God hit me right between the eyes. And I thought, oh, man. When we know we have done wrong and are confronted with our sins, the first response is usually to, to deny guilt and seek to blame another. And that's what got Adam and Eve thrown out of the garden. I'm of the opinion that Adam and Eve would have never gotten thrown out. Of the, this is just my opinion. I believe they might have been able to stay in the garden had they confessed their sins quickly. Because when God said, where art thou, Adam? It wasn't because God didn't know where Adam was. Matter of fact, anytime God asks a question, ain't because he don't know the answer. When God said, where art thou, Adam? That was an opportunity to get right. That was the first question. But God in his mercy asked a second question. Who told thee thou wast naked? As if God, God knew who told him. Second chance, God said, repent. Get right. But instead of getting right, Adam blamed somebody else. And he got thrown out of the garden. Amen? When Eve took that forbidden fruit, she instantly saw the good. This is, this is important to recognize. She saw the good. It was the good that deceived her. But she also saw the evil. For it was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When her eyes were first opened, she felt enlightened and liberated because she saw the good as well as the evil. When we first partake of sin, one of the first things we'll often feel is a liberty, a freedom. I mean, usually when you first backslide and quit doing the things of God, the, you'll feel, wow, I'm, I've, been, I've been set free. I'm free from that. And I, but then the next thing you're going to feel that's coming shortly behind it is condemnation. Because right behind the good is going to come the evil. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. However, along with that enlightenment, here comes the condemnation. And a lot of times when you first tell a lie, you feel a sense of relief. Whew, got out of that. <laughs> Whew, ain't got to worry about that no more. <laughs> Pastor thinks I'm... Somewhere else, pastor thinks this, pastor. And you feel that sense of relief. But then not far behind it. Here comes the voice of God and says, you shouldn't do that. To God's question, where art thou? Adam answered, I heard the, thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He told a whole lot of truths, but he didn't tell all the truth. When God asked if he had eaten the forbidden fruit, rather than admitting guilt, Adam blamed Eve. He was blaming God, really. He said, the woman whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat it. In other words, God, you're responsible for this. This world loves to blame God for sin. Why would God let a child be born to form? Why does God let bad things happen? God never wanted any of that mess. When he created this, he said, it's good. It's perfect. Where did it get bad when sin came in? 
all deformities, all those things. Matter of fact, when Jesus came to heal somebody in the New Testament, the, the, the Pharisee said, who sinned? Him or his parents? Jesus said, neither. Now, sin brought forth the, deform the problem. But it wasn't their direct sin. It was the chain. We're born in sin and shaped in iniquity because of Adam's sin. We all come into life having to get right with God. And because of sin, we come into life knowing how to lie, knowing how to cheat, knowing how to steal. And let me tell you something. If you hang around people that lie, cheat, and steal, you'll be doing it soon enough. There are countless people in penitentiaries today that are probably good people, but they chose the wrong environment to live in. Birds of a feather flock together. You'll never see an eagle in a chicken coop, and you'll never see a chicken on top of a mountain. You better look ahead and say, do I want to go to heaven, or do I want to go to hell? Because that's going to, in a large part, decide who you want to hang out with. Somebody say, praise the Lord. I remember one day I had a friend of mine. We were in church together, and we were there, and somebody was with us for a while, and they went AWOL, went off the rocker. And my buddy said to me in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, he said, I'm, I'm going out there and getting him. I said, you better not. You don't chase prodigals. Prodigals know the way home. The father went after the lost coin, and he went after the lost sheep, but he didn't go after the lost prodigal. He stayed at home and watched and prayed and hoped, but he didn't chase it. There's some things you go after. Some things you've got to have the good sense to say, uh-uh, they're making a choice. And so, and so he, he said, I'm going to get him. I said, man, you better be careful. He chose to leave. And I'm, I'm, God's my witness. Within a month, he was out there with him, partying and drugging and doing all the stuff they did. He's going to go get him. I said, you better stay in the house of bread. You better stay in the house of the Lord. And let's pray and be kind. And he's always, everybody's welcome back. I like what Brother Tenney said. Everybody's welcome, but the menu don't change. When you get back, we're still going to believe in holiness. We're still going to talk in tongues and receive the Holy Ghost. We're still going to baptize in Jesus' name. It's not one way. It's the only way. We don't know any other way to do it. That's the only way we do it. I still believe without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That means when you come to Jesus, He is holy. And the more you hang around Him, the more you're going to want to be holy. And there's going to be some things that God may put in your life He don't put in anybody else's life. And that's okay. I believe in personal convictions. There's some things that... you. you, you how can I say this right without being mis... Some things that God's going to say you can't do because that's been a problem for you. You know, when you go in the hospital, one of the first things they do is they take a history of you. Was your daddy a diabetic? Did, you, did you, anybody in your family have cancer? Anybody had arthritis? What they, why do they do that? Because they know those things travel. They're genetic. They follow, I don't know how they're genetic, but they follow patterns. So it is with sin. If, if your daddy had trouble with alcohol, you better stay away from it. If mama had trouble with lying, you better run from lying. Maybe you can't go where somebody else goes. I had a young man one time. He came to the Lord. He got baptized in Jesus' name. I gave him a Bible, said he got the Holy Ghost. And, and his spirit was, he was young in the Lord. His spirit was upset because some of the other kids from church would go to Applebee's to eat after service. And Applebee's right in the middle of their restaurant is a bar. And he had seen alcohol do terrible things to his family, and he was offended by that. It didn't bother the kids. They weren't going to the bar. They didn't go to drink. They, they set away from it. Somebody say amen. I mean, we have to live in this world. I mean, we, we, you got to be careful about it. You're going you're gonna to not take, take, I'm not going to partake of a, you can't shop anywhere then. My goodness. We're not called to dig a cave and, and be hermits. We're called to be lights that the world can see. 
salt that the world can taste. But he, he, he was a, and I said, I understand that. I said, I'll just start going eating with you after service wherever you want to go. And for a while we did that together. Because that was something I believe the Lord put on his spirit. You need to stay away from this. I didn't say, bless God, you're being ignorant. You shouldn't do like that. Just get over it. I said, no, 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 no. If the Holy Ghost dealt with you about that, you obey what God told you. But at the same time, you got to be careful. You don't round everybody else up and say, now listen, unless you got book for it, now listen, y'all going to have to do what I'm doing. There is a balance. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, anyhow. There were some results of eating from that fruit. And probably the greatest result was the condemnation they felt. That's why if there's sin in your life and you come into the presence of the Lord, you're going to feel the Lord start pricking your heart. All He wants you to do is repent. Now, here's the problem with sin. God has a forgetter. God who remembers everything can choose to forget some things. But Satan has a rememberer too. And one of the greatest weapons Satan has against us is our past. That's why in Romans, Paul said, What shall separate us from the love of God? Neither persecution, nor distress, nor peril, nor sword. Then he said, Nor things present, nor things to come. What did he leave out? Past. He never said your past can't separate you from the love of God. He said your present and your future can't, but he didn't say your past can't. Why? Because the devil will take your past and get a piggyback ride in your life. You don't deserve the things of God. You lied. You don't deserve the things of God. You cheated. Don't you remember? You're an adulterer. You're a murderer. Don't you remember all these things? And you got to put that stuff under the blood, and you got to forgive yourself. And say, devil, I've been to Calvary. I ask the Lord of glory to forgive me. And my Bible says He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from some. All? You mean all? All unrighteousness. That's why Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. Now the devil's not going to forget it. He's going to bring it up, but I'm going to just forget those things. I talked to Brother Anderson about some issues one time. I said, Brother Anderson, how do we handle this or that or the other? He said, Brother Gardner, if we cut people off, the devil wins. It made sense to me. You know what? I'm going to have to have mercy and grace and let God deal with some things. And if they come and they repent, I'm going to let God deal with it. Because I've got a whole lot of repenting myself to do. Somebody say, Praise the Lord. But there, be, there will be results of sin. Even if God forgives you, and God does forgive you, there are still some things that you got to carry around. Oh, that I could go back and not do some things I've done because I don't like the baggage. There was sorrow in childbirth. My wife told me more than once, I don't know why Eve did this to us. The oppression was pronounced upon the woman. The man was condemned to labor for the sustenance to, and to battle nature's elements for survival. How many of us men wish we could just wake up and be in paradise and say, Honey, breakfast is hanging on the tree out there. <laughs> Got a tree on every side of the house. Go get whatever you like. You Got Wendy's over here, McDonald's over here, Burger King over there. And it's all free. That's what paradise was. But no, 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 we got to set our clock. Get up and go to work. You know, that's the result of sin. I don't want to make you mad at sin right there. I got to sweat in my brow to survive now because of sin's curse on me. But don't seek to cover the deception because it will only end bad. We may be tempted to clear our record by implicating someone else. They made me do it. But you'll never get freedom as long as you blame somebody else. 
Matter of fact, I don't believe God will forgive you as long as you come to God and say, it's their fault. I don't believe you can come to God and say it's because of the way I was raised or where I was raised or how I was raised. or if somebody. The only way you're going to get forgiveness from God is when you say, it's my fault. David in Psalms 91 said, I and I only am guilty. Don't blame anybody else. Don't put any... Me, God. I did it. Forgive me. Those who have accused and blamed and slandered and hurt others, they're going to remember those things. Have you noticed that deception breeds more deception and lies breed more lies? That's why politicians every week have to invent new lies. What happened this week? Let's get some more lies spun out there. The more lies told, the more complex. Oh, it's not one politician. It's all of them. Because lies breed lies. The more lies told, the more complex is the tangled web of deceit and the more difficult it becomes to come clean and right the wrong. That's why Jesus said, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't build these complex web systems. Don't even do it with God. If you're struggling living for God, just say, God, I'm struggling living for you. I want to do it with your help, but listen, there's, there's some issues I'm still dealing with. And if you'll be honest with God, I believe God will step in and start helping you. But lies plant seeds of distrust in every relationship. Go to Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Luke 16 and verse 10 this morning. Luke 16, verse 10. A person who tells little lies tells big lies. That's what Jesus taught. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. That's why Jesus said, go to the next verse, when he said, if you'll be faithful in little, I'll make you rulers of much. But he's going to give us little first. Not because he doesn't know what we're going to do. He knows what we're going to do. So that we will know. God's, God's ways are not hard. He said, my burden's easy. My load's light. And I'll actually help you carry it. He said, get yoked up with me and we'll pull together. But the first things he gives are small things. He, it's not hard to get born again. It takes a matter of minutes to get born again. You've got to repent of your sins, get water baptized in Jesus' name, and God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Just like that. Not hard at all to get born again. But you got to do it. It's not that it's hard. Well, I'm going to wait till I get on my deathbed. Here's the bad news about that. When you get on your deathbed, God don't have a deathbed plan of salvation. He don't have a plan A and a plan B. He just has a plan A. I can prove it. God's no respecter of persons. He don't look at me and say, I got a plan for you, and look at Brother Marlon and say, no, I got a different plan for you. No, no, he got the same plan once and for all. And he'll be the judge at the end of days, but his plan is the same. And so when we come to God, he gives us little things to obey in. He says, be faithful in your tithes and your offering. Be faithful in your attendance. Be faithful. These aren't hard things. I can prove it. People can be faithful Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to a job. Come on. Come on. They can be faithful when they want to be faithful. But God is saying, now look, I gave you a church. This is the church I bought with my own blood and I gave you a church and he gave us apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers and God in his word said these are gifts he called them gifts I gave you gifts will you enjoy and take care and cherish the gifts I gave you these are little things if we don't take care of the little things he said if you'll be faithful in little and I'll make you ruler in much because if you're not faithful in little you won't be faithful in much and people get upset with God. Why won't he give me more? 
Because, you know, it, it's easy to tithe on one dollar, but it's hard to tithe on a million. Woo, if I won the lottery, I'd, I'd pay my tithes. No, you wouldn't. How you know? You don't pay your tithes now. I changed. Mm -mm. No, you wouldn't. God knows. God sees. Pastor, you don't know what a bind I'm in. Is your God big enough to get you out of a bind? Well, I'm going to do it without God. Okay. He'll let you. But please don't get mad at Him when it don't go well. Please don't run back and say, Now, God, why did you let this happen? He'll say, I didn't let that happen. You did this on your own. Well, glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody say, Thank you, Jesus. And the Bible does say, If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. And if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap of the Spirit. In other words, if you don't sow to the Spirit, if you don't take care of the things of God, you're not going to be able to run to the Spirit and say, Give me what I need from the Spirit. He can rightfully say, You didn't sow to the Spirit. You sowed to the flesh. What farmer runs out on the side of the hill when it's harvest time and say, Where's my crop? Shakes their hand in heaven. God, you owe me potatoes. And God looks down and says, You didn't sow any potatoes. We would laugh at them and say, they're just crazy. The same principle applies in the things of God. If you don't sow to the Spirit, you will not reap from the Spirit. It's tight, but it's right. I've got to take care of the things of God if I want the things of God to take care of me. If I make God's business my business, He'll make my business His business. Somebody say praise the Lord. Where are we at? Luke 16, verse 12, 11. If you therefore have not been faithful in the righteous man. And God goes right to the money. You notice that? Jesus, man, if he was the pastor, some people would be so mad at him, they'd be spitting bullets. All he wants to talk about is money, 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 money. That's a lot of what Jesus talked about. Why did he talk about it so much? Because our heart follows our money. The Bible says where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. He did not say where your heart is, there shall your treasure be. He said where your treasure is there. And it's true. When I was a young whippersnapper a few years ago, several years back now, man, I love sports so much. Now I like sports. Sports are not a sin. I love sports. You know why I love sports so much at that time in my life? I was putting my money into it. I was buying stuff about sports. and Oh, my heart followed the money. You ever heard of saying, follow the money? Truth is, you're following the money. You know when people pull out a newspaper and they go right to the to the, the S&P section, stocks and bonds section, and they go, people that ain't got no money in the stocks and bonds don't ever look at that section. They're like, I don't care what that stuff. Who cares? But somebody across the way is, how's it going? How's it going? How's it going? Put some more in that one. Put some more in that one. See, if your money's in it, your heart's coming. Isn't it amazing? Oh, help me, Lord Jesus. Malachi, when he talks about tithes and offerings, he said, Lord, how can we return to you? That's the previous verse we never quote. But they asked, how can we return to you? He said, in your tithes and offerings. Why did he say that? He said, if I ever get the money back in the house of the Lord, you'll be back. But you can repent and cry and weep and, and beg over an altar. But if your money don't, you won't be there long. You don't believe me. Go home and read Malachi. Read the whole chapter. We quote just a portion of it. But it, before, they, before he ever told them that, he said, they asked, how shall we return? How am I going to get back to God 
It's more than just hit an altar and say, Lord, forgive me. You got to start valuing the things of God and wanting them. How am I ever going to value them and want them? I don't want them right now, Pastor. Start giving to it. Your heart, your heart will follow. Deception. Everybody say deception. Where are we at? Verse 12. I'm sorry, stay right there. Go back. Go back. I didn't finish that verse. If you therefore have not been faithful with the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust the true riches? Verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? In other words, how can anybody trust you with what belongs to you if you hadn't been faithful with what belongs to God? Deception will result when in ruined relationships when individuals are not what they pretend to be. The realization develops that they cannot be trusted. And it takes a while to repair those bridges. Thankfully, they can be repaired. But it takes a while. Deceit will deliver disappointment. Deceit is dishonesty. Duplicity will develop distrust. What is duplicity? To pretend to be something you are not. And I can tell you as a pastor, we face that quite often. I've had even since I've been here five years as pastor, I've had people come through. I've had to warn others, listen, don't get too close to them. Oh, but pastor, they they putting on the, the spiritual and they got gifts. and a, Just let them be trustworthy. Give them time to prove. And there's been a couple instances I can think in my mind where I'm thinking, thank God we didn't lock together arms and walk together because they weren't going the same direction. Amos said, can two walk together except they be agreed? Come to find out later, they were hooking arms with anybody who would hook arms. That's the spirit of ecumenicalism, not the spirit of evangelism. Evangelism says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all, and you better get in the truth. That's evangelism. Ecumenicalism is everybody's right, nobody's wrong. Let's all get together and sing, come by y'all and go to heaven together. And if that's right, we can get rid of the Bible. Because the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Not be mean, not be hateful, just be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We are called to brand sin, sin. Love the sinners, but hate the sin. An adulterous relationship David had with Bathsheba was complicated with the pregnancy that resulted. Sin always gives birth. The Bible says, the man sins when he's led away of his own lust. And when sin hath conceived, conception is birth. If you stay in sin long enough, it's going to give birth to something in your life. And unlike some other things, when sin gives birth, you got to deal with it. Isn't it amazing? God told Abraham, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and go up the hill. Do you know that wasn't true? It's not that God lied. It's that God had blinders on. He only saw Abraham through promise. But Abraham had another son named Ishmael. And God said, take, take, take thy son, thine only son. See, when we, when we get right with God, it's not that he don't see all. He, we still have to. Here's the problem. You still got to live with Ishmael. God's not going to take Ishmael away. But here's the good news. He won't take Isaac away either. You can still have the promise. But you're going to have to deal with Ishmael. But David got Bathsheba pregnant. And from adultery to attempted to cover it up. And more lies and more lies. And ultimately, murder of Uriah, her husband. And David thought everything was hid and everything was fine and everything was wonderful. In David's mind, nobody knows what I've done until one day in walks the preacher. He said, I want to tell you a little Sunday school story, David. 
There was a man who had one lamb and another man who had hundreds of lambs. And the man with hundreds of lambs took the lamb away from the man with one lamb. And David said, that man should die. And the preacher put his finger in David's face and said, you're the man. Sometimes that's the only way God can deal with us. We think everything's covered. Nobody knows. And we come to an altar. And there God sticks his finger in our face and says, you're the one. And David had an option right then. You got to understand, David was the king. He could have cut the preacher's head off. Herod did it. Herod cut off John's head because John called out his sin. And the girl danced before him and asked for him. And he said, all right, we'll cut his head off. Here's the sad dilemma of that story. Never again in Herod's life was there a preacher that said, you got to repent. When he cut off John's head, it's the only time in the Bible that I found where Jesus would not respond to somebody. The Bible says Jesus opened not his mouth. Herod asked Jesus all kinds of questions, and Jesus wouldn't talk to him. Why wouldn't Jesus talk to Herod? Because he cut off the preacher's head. When you cut off the preacher, you cut off the Word. And God won't deal with us outside of His Word. He's chosen by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. And when David looked at that prophet and he said, you're the man, he had to make a choice. Am I going to cut his head off or am I going to hit my knees? And he hit his knees. And God forgave him. He had to suffer some consequences, but God forgave him and the kingdom was not rent from him. God wants to forgive us. But beyond forgiving us, He wants us to turn away from those things. Because the problems of lying will destroy us. Let's stand. There's a lot more, but I've covered enough.